Hello and welcome to another JJ's cooking show or whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is again where I basically just give a cheap meal and I attempt to cook it even though I'm not a very good cook. But anyway, well, go. this is basically cheese, uh, the, the, the mince pie basically, mince beef and vegetable pie. And I got this recipe from the uh, from this book that was uh, that was done by the Limerick Money Advice and Bud Budgeting Service. I don't know if they still do this. This is must be about ten years old at this point, but uh, it's it's a very good book if you can find it. But anyway, the uh, the various bits and pieces that we're using here is as uh, as ever. Where the heck did I put it? Here it is. Obviously, this is amateur. Uh, 450 grams of mince. Uh, by the way, I've seen shops now sell sell mince in packets of 400 grams, uh, and hoping nobody would notice for the same price. Unfortunately, a pound of mince is 400 and is just over 450 grams. So it's I think it's 454 to be exact. But um, basically, except uh, no substitutes. Get the go to wherever you can and get the actual right weight weight of meat for yourself. Salt and pepper, as usual. Uh, you, so the recipe calls for two uh, carrots, uh, chopped, uh, skin peeled and chopped, or you can go with baby carrot, with frozen baby carrots if you're lazy like me. I also like to put in some uh, peas, like the some peas about uh, about two thirds of a cupful, and uh, most importantly, if I can find them, because I should have these things out. Yes, here we are. Oxtail soup. Now you can actually use beef and vegetable soup, or pretty much any any soup you like if you want, because it does make a difference in flavor. But oxtail, we're, we're doing oxtail soup today because it's the original uh, flavor. I actually kind of prefer beef and vegetable to be honest, but we'll we'll go with this. And an onion, and 425 milliliters of water. So that's pretty pretty much it. Oh yes, and of course potatoes. Yeah, don't forget the potatoes. We can never forget the potatoes. That's pretty much it. And I will be right back to you. And once again, this is pretty simple to prepare. It's very cheap and it will and it lasts me a few days. I've been eating this for years. So I will be right back to you when we, when we get, get on to some presentation. Because I'm going to show you how to actually chop a chop an onion. Which I only found this out fairly recently myself. So we'll get we'll get on to that. Pausing the video. Okay. Now, the most important thing to remember when you're when you're chopping an onion is that the way an onion is structured is that basically it's a load of leaves that are used to store energy for the winter. That's basically what an onion is. That's why it's all layered up because as it grow it grows every year and then the stem dies away and all the energy is left in the leaves. It's got but they're all connected to the bottom here. The root. So if you chop that off, that's the, the the onion will fall apart. That's what most. Uh, that's where I made the mistake for years myself. So basically, to keep an onion together, you can you have to keep the bottom, the bottom together, and then you simply just chop it like this, and so you're making a kind of a cross section like that, and then you cross, and then you chop it like this. So you're making basically you're making a tic tac toe board or chess board on top of the on top of it, and then let's get rid of this and make sure we don't have any of the lights here. And then you simply um, go down like this, and the onion will fall apart into something that looks vaguely professional. And you and again, you can just hold. You could it, it's held together really well. And then if there's any large parts there, you can just kind of chop them like that. And that's pretty much it. That's how you chop up an onion. And like I said, it only takes a minute or a minute or so when you do it right. And I'm sure people who can actually cook are going, oh my God, that's so terrible. Well, like I said, I'm not a good cook. Okay, if I can do it, you can do it, All right? Anyway, be right back.
Hello there. Hi. Uh, as you can see, we're in the middle of preparation. So I put in some salt, pepper, and the milk that the meat is nicely browning away. And we're going to put in some of the baby carrots. Yeah. Probably a bit too much freezing on those, but anyway. And finally, the onions. So, and that's pretty. And so we now mix the mix all this together until it looks better. Looks okay. Yeah, I had these uh, baby carrots in my freezer for a bit too long, so probably could have um, gone with the actual uh, <coughs> the actual proper carrots, but whatever. They're in there now, and if you don't see me again, I poison myself. So we just leave these leave these go for um, for a few minutes before we get to the next stage of our experimentation. I should mention something while I'm doing this. Um, I don't actually eat peeled potatoes anymore. So I put the potatoes in here uh, unpeeled. And the reason for that is I just happen to prefer the taste. And really, I am hopeless at peeling potatoes. When I peel a potato, it tends to fall apart. And um, I kind of I, I kind of cut more potato off in the peel than I, that then goes into my stomach. So a few years ago, I decided to just try it without it. And it wasn't too bad. I actually liked it. It was a bit more crunchy. And... Um, Basically, I think it's a little bit just, you get a bit more nutrients if you go in there and a bit more roughage. Uh, the only thing you have to do is you have to be very careful about washing the potatoes first. Because if you get any kind of eyes or the growing bits of the potato into it, that taste is not fun. It'll, it tastes horrible. So you have to make sure that everything scrubs thoroughly. It's, so basically, it just means going over it with, uh, you know, with, with, a, with a cloth under under a tap. Other than that, it's not too, it's no different than using unpeeled potatoes, and it saves a bit of time for me. So if you want to try it, go ahead. If you don't, that's cool too. I just thought I'd let you know what I do. Okay, now this is where the soup comes in. Now, as you might have noticed, I didn't mix this together, even though the recipe does say you should. For the simple reason that I, if I do it beforehand, it just kind of collects up at a scum on the top. And I like to actually have it mixed in before I pour this into the mixture with the rest of the ingredients. So what I do is I just wait till, the, till I'm about to, to um, till I'm ready, and then I pour it in, stir it up, and then put it and then pour it in myself. That's okay. So, and then, there we go. And then we keep stirring this around until it gets thick. It doesn't take too long. It just takes a couple of minutes once you pour this in. But the soup will thicken. And uh, then you get a very, very nice, uh, nice color on it. It goes, very, it goes very much darker. You'll see in a second. Um, this is the point where I, where everybody goes, what do you say now when you're just stirring this thing and waiting for it to actually start, start working? Well, I thought I would give a little bit of local lore while I'm doing this. As those people who know me, or whatever, I originally, or who don't, well, I originally came from Eskeaton, and my last job was in the Eskeaton tourist office. While I was there, I was working with a very nice woman by the name of Fiona Ryan. Now her, I, th I think it was her great-great-grandfather or great-grandfather or something like this, had a bit of a story to him in that he was, he successfully sued the White Star Line over the Titanic disaster. And this particular wo woman I mentioned researched it herself and created a little, uh, created a museum in the in the in the Skeeton Tourist Centre. The story is that basically Skeeton lost had four people on the Titanic, and two of them died. So one of them's brother, uh, whose name whose name was the aforementioned Michael Ryan, decided to sue the White Star Line. Now he was just a farmer, you know, in a Skeeton, uh, not exactly a very important person. 
but he decided to sue them anyway. And he, he quite rapidly found out that he couldn't sue them about the amount of uh, life rafts on the Titanic because basically they were in compliance with the law. It was a stupid law, but they were in compliance with it, so they couldn't sue him about that. But what they, but what they discovered from the survivors is that, all, is that the, the four of them only got one ticket. And the ticket, they had all the safety information about where to go in the, if, if, um, if, the, if the ship was in trouble, where the exits are and where the lifeboats were. So they sued the White Star Line because there was no way to prove that all four of them had read the safety information. And he won. He actually won a fair, a fair decent chunk of change from the White Star Line because they could not prove that all four of them had read the safety information. That's why everybody who goes on a plane or a boat or anything gets a ticket. And that's what got on the back of the ticket is the safety information. So there you go. A little bit of fairly local lore that has that had worldwide implications to this very day. That's why everybody gets a ticket and that's why there's safety information on the back of the ticket. Okay. So, you learned something new about, about the local history. Askeaton actually was one of the most heavily affected towns in Ireland by it, if not the most affected, effective. Because they had four people. I mean, these people were in steerage. They weren't important passengers at all. And for the life of me, I couldn't tell you what their names were. But, that's, but basically, that's uh, the story of the connection between Askeaton and West Limerick in general and the Titanic. So there you go. Now, let's just check that the potatoes are good to go. Yeah, they're fine. All right. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. We'll just leave that to one side. Okay. Now. As you can see, I don't have any, uh, I, as I mentioned, I don't, I've I peeled, I did not peel the potatoes. It makes no difference for in terms of mashing them or anything else, honestly. You know, just basically, you just chop them up and then you, and then you get mashing. And it's the same as, uh, it's the same as uh, normal. That's a bit of milk and butter. And, I just had a panicked moment when I when I thought, oh my God, where's my potato masher? Because I forgot to bring it out. But as it happened, it was right there in my drawer waiting for me. So I wasn't too embarrassed by looking at it. And I always put too much milk in my mashed potatoes. I always go, I must put less milk in there. And then I just go, glorp. And there I go. So yeah, this isn't very good mashed potatoes. It's, it's too runny. But we will go. We will go with it as is. You would think that after years of making this thing, I would stop making the same mistake. But there you go. Yeah, such a Okay. Now, here I have casserole dish. All right, we'll get this out of the way. Now. We pour the liquid from this into the casserole dish. This is the ba these are the bits where they uh, always have. Now here's one we prepared earlier. Unfortunately, I'm not a guy on television, so you're just going to have to wait for me while I do this. Yeah, that's fine. And now here's the, 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 the thing which people call spooning. And when I first read it, I was like, what the hell do you, what the hell is spooning? Well, it literally is pretty much what it says. You literally take some of this and you just pour, put it on top of the thing like this. And it floats. The mash will float on top of the mixture because the density of the mash is less than the density of the, um, of the mixture. And that's how you get your, uh, your, your stuff on top of your, sh of your cottage pie. 
I had to train myself to stop calling it shepherd's pie because technically shepherd's pie is made with mutton. And this is made with beef, so it's cottage pie. Of course, everybody just calls it shepherd's pie anyway, so I don't know why, why I'm bothering. Uh, good God. Turn that off. I wouldn't have put it on the on the cooker, but I didn't want to be moving the camera around. So, and that is pretty much it. Now, okay, there's one final little bit of preparation just to smooth this out, and it's to get an ordinary fork, and then just lightly go like this. For two reasons. One, it's, ni it's nice to smooth everything out and it gives it a nice little thing, a nice little pattern on top. And B, the ridges increase the surface area of the uh, of the pie and makes it absorb more heat from the from the oven. So it'll actually um, stiff. It'll actually dry itself out a bit better. So yeah, there's science behind this. Okay. And that's it. And uh, basically, you've preheated your oven to 180 degrees Celsius, or if you prefer, uh, 375 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you open your oven and you shove it in. Uh, there. And that, as I say, is that. Now you leave it in there for 45 minutes, and I will be right back with it we will, so you can see the finished product. Hello there, and it's the moment of truth. And uh, before anyone asks, did I burn my, uh, my oven gloves when I dramatically threw them on the oven? Yeah, uh, I scorched them, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah, just because it goes to show you, you should actually be careful when it comes to hot stuff. But yeah, thankfully no harm was done. Anyway, we're about to have the moment of truth when we have our wonderful pie thing coming out of the oven. And here we are. Yep. Okay, let's just close this room. Now get in there, okay. And there it was. I had it in my mind. This is going to be a, like a dramatic moment, but I just seems to have uh, be messing up. Anyway, uh, there it is. Let's see. Gotta just get the camera right. Yeah, as you can see, it's looking pretty nice. And yeah, I know it's not the most uh, it's not the most professional looking of pies, but who cares? I'm gonna I'm gonna be the one eating it. Anyway, that's about it. That's my. Um, that's my cottage pie recipe. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you find it useful. And I will talk to you soon. Take care of yourselves, everyone. Bye-bye.